What's up, everyone? We're back for another episode of Locked On Bucks, and uh, similar to our last podcast, uh, Milwaukee just racking up the preseason L's at the moment. There's only a couple of games to go, uh, but we have to discuss at some point uh, what does any of this mean uh, for the regular season, which is only a week away now. So we're going to wrap up the trip to Abu Dhabi and a couple of losses to Atlanta Hawks. Let's get started. You are Locked On Bucks. Your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Bucks. I'm your host, Kane Pittman. You can see and hear me on this show Monday to Friday. You can also find some other stuff over at ESPN alongside me, the founder of brewhoop.com and longtime voice of the podcast, Frank Madden. Of course, we thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first listen or watch uh, of every weekday as uh, the regular season only a week away, as I said. So everyone's starting to get a little bit fired up, Frank. But uh, the Bucks probably aren't getting too fired up at the moment. They're 0-3 in preseason. Hasn't been the most inspiring uh, basketball we've ever, we've ever seen. With a team that has such high expectations, I think generally the last couple of years we've looked at the Bucks and taken it the regular season through the lens of, okay, well, they're trying things. What does it really matter? The postseason's where it matters. No Giannis in this game. No Middleton, perhaps for a little while. But defensively, there were some issues in this game. Let's say against the Hawks, they lose 118, 109. So, how seriously should we be taking this? So, I went back and looked at the Bucks' preseason records the last four years under Bud. And 1819, uh, they go three and one. They had like a plus 17 point differential. They were, you know, I mean, people probably remember that season. What did they start, like 6 or 7-0, and I think, something like that, before they had that that loss in Boston. Um, but they came out firing, right? I mean, new system didn't matter. Like, they were locked in. And I think that that is the upside of, like, a new coaching staff, a new system, is that there's a lot of engagement early on, including even in the preseason. And you see, you know, maybe more interest <laughs> in competing. And these games ultimately don't matter. 1920 season, Bucks go 5-0. and in the preseason so those first two years when the bucks were the best team in the league they were also very good in preseason the last couple of years so the 2021 season the championship season they go 0 three in the preseason um the following year last year they go one and four you may remember i don't recall exactly how many games Giannis played in the preseason but you know Giannis has generally not played like every preseason game like he's been generally pretty limited the past few years in terms of actual preseason minutes. Um, and obviously that's been a theme here so far of this preseason as well, dropping 0-3. Giannis has played 21 minutes in in three games. Um, so I don't think you necessarily, you know, I, I don't think you need to worry a whole lot about it. I mean, I would certainly like feel better if the one game when the Bucks actually played eh, close to their, to their best guys, that, you know, they looked great and they were, you know, plus 20 and and then it was just the, the garbage time stuff that hurt them. But, you know, even when Giannis was in, um, you know, it's not like they were, they looked great against that Hawks team. So, um, I, again, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I'm, I'm worried about it. I think we've talked about maybe some of the reasons for concern from a regular season perspective for the Bucks. Just again, Milton out early complacency may be setting in a little bit given that this team knows that it's a marathon and not a sprint and they're a team that knows that they can win on the road in the playoffs given what they did in the 21 playoffs so are they going to have necessarily the urgency in the regular season to again win at a high level and and obviously we've talked about that trade-off of you know if you don't really try to win a ton of regular season games then you are probably going to put yourself in a tougher spot come playoffs because if you don't have home court in say the second round, which obviously happened last year, they, you know, wouldn't have had to put in a lot more effort to potentially even go for the number one seed last year. Um, instead, they end up having to go on the road in the second round. And obviously we know what happened there. Maybe that, maybe it turns out differently if they have home court in the second round, who knows? Um, so again, Returning back to the point, though, what does this really matter? I don't think probably a whole lot, but there's only five preseason games as well. So, you know, if you're a Green Bay Packer fan, which maybe not a great day to be 
reminding people of the Green Bay Packers having just lost an extremely uh, painful slash pathetic fashion in London earlier today. Great morning for, for me and, and Packer fans. I uh, hope our friend Peter Bukowski's uh, working through things on Lockdown Packers. Um, but, you know, the Packers famously, like, don't play Aaron Rodgers in the preseason at all, right? <laughs> and then they've had horrible game ones the last two years. And with the Bucs, it will be interesting to see, you know, from a start perspective, they play in Philly on opening night, and then they have a bit of a favorable schedule to start the season. You know, you don't want to come into the season and stub your toe and really struggle early on because, again, you just never know when, you know, those those lost opportunities may come back to haunt you. And with Chris Middleton being out, you know, maybe the first few games of the season, we'll see. I think Zach Lowe referenced optimism that he would be back earlier in the season, not be out too long. Um but that obviously makes life more difficult and you're going to need, you know, more consistency from everybody to overcome the absence of Chris. So um, I don't think, you know, again, no, nothing worth panicking. Obviously these Abu Dhabi games are weird for a number of reasons, given the travel and the circumstances and who's playing and not playing and things like that. But, you know, again, I think obviously the Bucks hard to look at them and say they're plant firing on all cylinders right now. And, you know, I think everybody can come into a season and look at names on paper and say like, and, and feel better about depth than I think the reality that often kicks in once guys are actually playing, once injuries kick in, et cetera. And I think certainly watching a lot of the younger guys, the deeper bench guys in these first three games has reminded us that like, yeah, there's not like 10 guys that you want to be playing in the playoffs on this, on this roster. And so hopefully some of these guys, up their game over the course of the season, but certainly a very uneven first three games that we've seen so far. And just on last year as well, uh, I'm sure no one forgets about this, but when you spoke about the shaky preseason, then they really turned it on on opening night. So we we have seen this team from time to time go through the motions and then even sometimes just straight up in the fourth quarter of games, the defense will go to a complete another level. But there is a danger in playing that way through the regular season, particularly if you are missing uh, key players. And I, I guess the other thing that we, we shouldn't forget, and sometimes we forget because they won the title, but they also would have had to go without home court advantage the whole way through if it wasn't for Philadelphia completely choking against the Atlanta Hawks. So they did get a little bit fortunate there mm-hmm. in terms of scheduling as well. So it really does matter. But overall, the general rule for us if Giannis isn't playing, then you, it really kind of doesn't matter. So I guess that that's, that's the big point here. Although I was a little surprised. We did discuss the fact that this was a big moment for the NBA, the Abu Dhabi games. I thought Giannis was going to play in both uh, because now when you look ahead uh, to the rest of the preseason, they get a strange back-to-back in preseason, which I, I, I don't know how often that happens, but clearly they're trying to cram in games because of the travel. So they'll go to Chicago Tuesday night, then back home Wednesday uh, to host... Uh, the Brooklyn Nets. So anyway, two more preseason games, but I can't imagine Giannis is playing uh, in both of those. We are going to continue to talk about Marjan Bochamp because he is one of the more interesting uh, players on this team. So I think more broadly, whether it's this game or bigger picture, we should talk about Marjan Bochamp next. But I want to talk about LinkedIn. Uh, These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business, which is why the Marjan Bochamp uh, was was a great segue here because he's he's a new uh, he's a new Milwaukee Bucks player. But you want to be hundred percent certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find those qualified candidates you want to talk to, and you can do it in swift time. So all you have to do is post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. At 21 minutes for Marjan Bochamp in this one. Uh, what are we... So I, I guess the question I have, so, and you tweeted something about more broadly to the idea that Jordan Moore and Marjan Bochamp, as we've discussed, are going to be in the mix for real minutes here early in the season. I don't think either is necessarily <laughs> lit it up. Is that I don't know what term you want to go with here. But I would say personally, there would be a probably 
because there's more familiarity, because there's more NBA experience in terms of obviously the minutes Jordan Moore has played, there is more of a safety element with just giving those minutes to Jordan Warrior to start the season. But I, he's in year three. I, I still would like to see if there's going to be minutes there to work through some stuff with Marjan Bochamp in the first few weeks of the season and at least give him a shot. And clearly it's going to be rocky. And, and I think historically, you know, Bud likes to have a more consistent brand of basketball on the floor. And that's probably not going to be the case with a rookie playing with the guys that we hope he's playing with. But what do you see? Is anything changed in terms of what you would uh, like to see early in the season based on what we've seen in a pretty small sample of Bochet? Yeah. And, and with, I mean, I think we talked about coming into training camp, the most interesting thing that we saw was, you know, this, this implied battle for minutes between Wara and Bochamp given no Chris Middleton, given no Jing Joe Ingles to start the year. If either of those guys actually like played well in preseason or like seem to be getting it, then, you know, it's golden opportunity for those guys to actually see regular season minutes early in the year versus, you know, hopefully you get more healthy as the year goes on rather than less healthy. Um, you know, it, it our, I think our general assumption was it's probably going to be harder for those guys to get on the floor once obviously those those veterans come back into the fold so you know people i, I made the i made the joke if given the choice between playing jordan war or march on bochamp i choose chris middleton with one functioning hand or joe ingles in a wheelchair um you know guys you gotta add some levity to a a blowout preseason loss uh some people were were, were not happy with this i I think I think there were probably like eight to ten people who who seemed offended. Nobody, by the way, nobody was offended on behalf of Jordan Wara. <laughs> a few people. I did get a few tweets, Frank, telling me to to really pull you into line. Can you pull Frank into line? <laughs> what? What? I think there were. I think there was one or two people who who, who literally said shame on me. And there were a couple of people who said that I am oh turning on turning on Marjan Bochamp. Like hmm. this is you know a great tragedy or something like that. Um, I mean, guys, just freaking calm down okay you know it's it's sort of this weird thing where i feel like everybody i think people are generally like understand that rookies have a hard time being good right even guys that put up some numbers generally are not helping you in basketball games so it's just this weird dissonance between like most people seem to get that like yeah and i obviously do as well like you know marjan bochamp was probably never going to come in and actually be like a positive nba player I don't know that anybody that anybody will pick in the late first round, second round, you, you know, you don't expect that. Um, but to say it out loud that a guy like, you know, doesn't, can't, can't, can't really play well right now, or like doesn't know what's going on on the floor. I mean, are we not allowed to, <laughs> are we not allowed to acknowledge the reality that we're seeing? Cause you know, it's, it's been a tough, it's been a tough uh, three games for Marjan, but it, like a bunch of people said, like it's only been two games. It's like, well, uh, technically it's been three <laughs> three games and there's only two games left in the preseason. So, you know, yeah, it, it, you know, nobody's saying close the book on Marjan Bochamp's NBA career, but again, to the extent that there was an opportunity for him to actually like get some minutes early in the season, he's done nothing to like make Bud actually want to play him is, is my, is my argument. And again, I take no pleasure in saying that, but you know, he's got 10 points on three out of 13 shooting nine fouls and seven turnovers right and to me the probably the nine fouls and seven turnovers is is the bigger concern because i mean literally he doesn't touch the ball very much but it seems like half times that he does he's you know traveling he's getting turned up throwing the ball away he's fouling a lot fortunately game three only one foul i think only one turnover i think in um in wherever he had 20 minutes or something so um you know, hopefully, or thank you. I think he had two turnovers. Like, you think he turned over maybe on like his first two touches. Um, so I mean, hopefully, there's some progress there, but I mean, it's it's pretty rough right now. And again, you didn't draft him for you know him to be an instant impact offensive player. Um, but you know, defensively, like, yeah, you can see kind of the outlines of the tools and you know, some steals, some blocks, things like that, but certainly not a guy that I think at this point is, is positively impacting the defense. And so, yeah, it's just it's just tough for him right now. You know, I was kind of underwhelmed by him in Vegas. Um, and so far preseason, like, you know, yeah, he hasn't really jumped off the page and again, no one's saying you got to give up on him or something like that. Right. I think you know, everybody knew it was probably going to take a little while with him and he has a weird backstory as well, given that yes, he played for the ignite last year in the G league. So I mean, that's a generally a positive thing. 
but his background beyond that, right. And he kind of was like, I want to say an unknown, but you know, he was not like the high school superstar, you know, destined to be a first round pick the entire time type of guy. And had obviously the very unusual sort of pandemic experience where he's basically working out for the start of the pandemic. Then he ends up, you know, going back home, ends up playing in the community college for, for part of a year. So it's weird because he's not young. He's going to be 22 early in this season. So he's not like some 19 year old, you know, amorphous piece of clay that you can shape into whatever you want. He's going to get bigger and stronger, you know, hopefully get stronger. But, um, you know, again, if, if a guy doesn't show you much of anything early in this, in their career, and then, I mean, I think it does, it has to impact at least your, your optimism somewhat. So I, I've definitely moderated any slight hope I had that that he would really be a contributor early in the season. And again, who knows? You know, maybe he just needs to see some shots go down. Um, but it just seems like the game has not slowed down for him. It just seems like everything's going a bit fast for him, which I think explains some of the turnovers, some of the filing. And obviously, you know, we talked about him maybe having the first game jitters. He kind of said as much after game one. Um, but that was a game where, you know, he was playing against other guys for the most part that were in a similar spot, right? I mean, David Roddy, Jake LaRavia, those guys didn't look nervous, even though they were also guys that were drafted in a similar spot. So, um, you know, it's probably, I think you just get ready for it to be a bit of a slog with him. And I mean, of course, like, look, I'm, I'm like everybody in that I, I always want to hold out hope, uh, you know, that your rookies are, <laughs> are going to be able to contribute and, you know, maybe they just need a little bit of a chance here and there and they, they show a spark. So, Hey, I, I'd love it if they could find him some minutes early in the season. Um, but I think if, you know, to be honest right now, if, if only Chris and Joe Ingles are hurt, right. Let's assume Wes Matthews, who we haven't seen so far. Let's assume this ankle injury, right. It doesn't seem like it's serious. If, if Wes is healthy, if the guard rotation is healthy, um, I mean, I don't know that we'll see either of those guys um, night to night. I, I certainly wouldn't expect to see Marjon early in the season uh, unless there's potentially some more injuries or obviously if games are like uncompetitive and, and Bud gets to kind of, you know, throw throw some of the bench guys out there. So, you know, we'll, we'll kind of see how things how things evolve. You obviously always hope that rookies will, will get some chances in the season to kind of show what they're learning. And But in the meantime, you know, I think – for him uh, and Jordan War, I mean, War is a bit different because he's, you know, been at this a couple of years now. Um, you know, I, I don't think we've seen anything in the preseason to suggest like, oh, these guys are, you know, really making their case for for regular season minutes, or they're really making their case to be the ninth or tenth guy. I mean, at this point, if those guys play, it'll be more by default because you know there's just you know injuries and things like that versus because they've really shown growth and, and, and a handle on, on kind of what's going on out there. And I think for, for Wara, you know, we talked about, he had a good offensive first game, but since then, you know, let's just say he's been pretty uneven and, you know, I don't think the defense is obviously uh, it's not like he went and became a good defender over the summer. So, um, so yeah, I think uh, expectations for me, not, not sky high for those guys, but and at least can can maybe carve out a little bit of a role at some point. And um, I think Wara certainly to me just seems more like, you know, filler contract than than probably anything at this point, given we've seen him a couple of years now. But, you know, cross my fingers, hope I'm wrong. Hope my my rookie realism uh, is uh, is made to show as 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 unwarranted skepticism. But for now, you know, uh, probably one of the few things we can use the preseason for is sort of evaluating some of these younger guys and just sort of seeing where they are. And obviously it's, it's been kind of a tough, a tough road so far for those guys. All right. I want to continue to move on to some of the other players we haven't spoke about a lot. Serge Barker has actually played a relatively decent amount of minutes in the preseason, but uh, let us know what you think about Marjon Beauchamp. I know they'll most likely be some passionate opinions. I, I referenced on our last podcast that, um, I think the both of us have have been accused of being negative towards Jordan War and, and Bochamp. But again, as I mentioned on the last podcast, I think that we really have to realistically look at how they're going to get minutes on this team. And as you pointed to, it might be difficult for those. But if you are a Bucks fan, would do you just want to force somehow Bochamp minutes? I mean, how patient are you willing to be, particularly early in the season? Where, as we mentioned, the Bucks are going to want minutes. I would bet uh, want wins. I'm going to bet that there is uh, some Bucks fans that want him to play uh, no matter what. Uh, and uh, look, we've referenced 
the NFL odds at betonline.net in recent times. And as uh, Frank said, it's a tough day if you're a Green Bay Packers fan. But if you think that they can bounce back next week, then go to betonline.net and check all the odds for uh, the NFL, uh, particularly when it comes to futures. And maybe if you're uh, seeking a bit of value there, maybe the odd loss here or there isn't uh, isn't a bad thing, Frank. Bit of silver lining uh, for Packers fans. And as always, Bet Online remains your continued source for all your sports wagering information with live betting and up to the minute scores for every sport out there, including obviously the NBA, the MLB playoffs. Uh, postseason is going on right now, MMA, boxing, and also golf. So head to betonline.net or use your mobile device to learn more. That's Bet Online, where the game starts. Uh, I referenced Serge Barker, but before we get to that, uh, there is one big development uh, from this second game against the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, and outside of uh, the shooting of Trey Young, who was 11 for 15, I think he was 7 for 9 from 3. He, he dropped 31 points in about 18 minutes. I mean, it was quite ridiculous. Uh, but you do realize that uh, Javon Carter finished the night 100% from the floor. <laughs> I mean, this man. I mean, uh Give me more of it, you know. Um, I, I think we talked about after, uh, well, I guess it was, was it game two? I can't remember if it was game one or game two, but jo- uh, Javon Carter and George Hill coming in together and playing together a fair bit. Um, you know, George Hill, I think, was two for two, hit a couple threes in this game. And pr- probably the most interesting thing was uh, there was that play where he drove and, and the the play was whistled dead, but he went up and, and dunked and actually looked athletic for a moment. And it was like, oh, George, you still have that in you. That was nice to see. Um, I, I, you know, I, I fully expect to see Javon Carter, you know, at the start of the season. And my guess is, especially if Jordan Wara and, and Marjan Bochamp are, you know, not winning over Bud's trust and, and looking shaky on, on both ends, obviously Jordan, you'd expect to, to kind of be, getting things together a bit on, on offense at some point. Um, I mean, I think you'll see both those guys on opening night, you know, health, health allowing. So, um, so yeah, I, I mean, Javon Carter, you know, we kind of always joke, you know, how long can he shoot 50% from three? Um, you know, the three he hit on Saturday, I think was kind of an off balance, like tough, tough looking shot. So, um, so we'll see, we'll see if that offense can, be a little more of a threat than sort of historically has been with him. Um, I think, you know, given the way the Bucks operate, you don't need, you know, your backup point guard to be a shot hunter. We don't need Javon Carter to be, you know, trying to be Jordan Clarkson or something out there. But I mean, if he can shoot it the way he has, and, and again, like mean regress it for, for a bit more realistic, but I mean, it's good to see, right? I mean, he, he generally looks confident getting – he's not a guy that's going to get to the rim, and he's he's obviously small and undersized, but he looks really comfortable from mid-range all the way out to, to three-point range. And, it's again, it's not just wide-open threes that, that he's been hitting. So, hey, Javon Carter, more power to him. And um, good to see both those guys uh, healthy. And, and now we also George hitting some threes, which – um, remember, remember when George Hill was almost a 50% three point shooter a few years ago, like that seems like a long time ago. We'll see if he still has, uh, any of that in him, but, um, you know, again, those are two guys that, uh, that certainly are, um, guys that I think Bud is showing you trust. I think over the last few years, we should remember there has been guys where we have said, well, they can't keep doing that. And George Hill was one of them from three. And then Bobby Portis was the other one. So at least Javon Carter, if, if you start it from a point of it's like 60 plus percent, you've got a f- fair bit of room to still be <laughs> an elite shooter. You know, I mean, we're talking over 40, 42, 43, 44, perhaps. Uh, maybe Javon Carter's a guy. He's another uh, fan favorite, I would say, uh, among uh, Bucks fans. Certainly a player that people are interested in. So you referenced George Hill. So I, I think I mentioned this in the podcast a couple of weeks ago, but uh, the Bucks were doing this social media um, yeah, whatever, skit thing. And they were asking players who would they most like to dunk on. And George Hill said, I'm pretty sure he said Serge Barker, and he said that he, he recently tried to dunk on him or Jordan Wara. Someone mentioned George Hill trying to dunk on a Barker. And I remember thinking to myself, that's actually noteworthy because I didn't know whether he could possibly do that at this point. So, yeah, maybe he's got a bit of bounce left and maybe they both play. I mean, we've spoken a lot about the backup point guard battle, but as we've seen, Bud has kind of tossed them out there uh, at the same time. But speaking of Serge Barker, so another guy that was kind of curious 
when he re-signed, uh, we didn't really see enough of him last year to have any idea of whether or not he has anything left in the tank. Have you seen anything in preseason so far that would suggest one way or the other with Serge? Because he has actually played you know, decent minutes. I mean, a lot of players have, but we've seen a little bit. Yeah, I mean, he's looked solid. I mean, he definitely looked pretty pretty spry in, in the first game in Abu Dhabi. I'm just checking what, what he did in uh, in this game. Yeah, I mean, he only took one shot in this game, but yeah. um, five cool. fouls and four turnovers. So, yeah, Serge, game two in, in Abu Dhabi, not great. Um, I, I'm, I'm very interested just how Bud approaches the, the big minutes, right? We've seen um, – Last year, more by kind of less by choice, more just by because he had to. Uh, the Bucks sort of playing essentially three big men, um, and I, I think I think it will be interesting to see with with Brooke and Brooke presumably healthy. Um, you know, does he just play uh, two centers every night, where with Serge coming in and and spelling Brooke, or or does you know, does it become more tactical thing where Serge plays some nights and, and some nights he doesn't play at all? Uh, I don't know. It's it's just one of these things that probably Bud's going to have to figure out. I, you know, I, I don't think Serge resigns if he was just going to literally not play most nights. So I'm guessing there was there's an assumption, impl- an implicit agreement that he will play a fair bit this year. Uh, and so we'll see. We'll see what he has left in the tank. And he physically seems okay. Um, but I'm also not at the point where I'm like saying like, oh yeah, you know, you get Toronto Serge Ibaka, he, he could be really useful in pulling the playoffs too, right? And let's we can pump the brakes on that a bit. I sort of want to see see what he looks like in practice. Um, well, figuratively in practice, i.e. in in actual games. Um, and we'll kind of go from there. But I, you know, I, I again the the safety blanket of having a veteran and seemingly healthy. Serge Ibaka uh, as an option off the bench if and when injury strikes or you just want to rest Brooke. Uh, it does give you a, a little bit of a safety blanket that obviously last year they just didn't have coming into the regular season. So, um, and, and of course, his, you know, his uh, fashion, his scarf game will, will be very on point. We know we can rely. <laughs> we know that part of his game will age well, uh, his, his fashion game. So, so we'll see. And it seems like he gets along well with Giannis and, and the locker room and you know, was cited as a reason why he, he came back. Giannis calling him, kind of giving him the pitch. So, um, so we'll see. And, you know, and I think there's a little bit too, I mean, <laughs> with all the talk about um, the Draymond Green and Jordan Poole quote unquote fight, you know, I was thinking a little bit about Bucks, you know, who, who are the guy, not necessarily like, you know, Bobby Portis obviously had that incident with, with Miritich in practice a number of years ago in Chicago, but just thinking about like guys who, you know, we've talked about, right. Who are the guys that bring a little toughness, a little edge, like who are the guys that, you know, will be the, the John Wayne toilet plate paper, right. The rough, tough, and won't take shit off anything types. And um, I think Serge is one of those guys. I mean, we know the dude will throw punches in, <laughs> in NBA games. He's been suspended multiple times for throwing punches. Sometimes I don't even know why he's throwing punches at, at dudes. Um, but we know Serge is a guy that will have his teammates back. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, again, not that you hired, you know, not that you signed Serge to go out and, and, uh, and be the enforcer per se, but, um, you know, hopefully he brings a little bit of that toughness veteran kind of component that, uh, you know, maybe they lacked a little bit last year. Yes. And you mentioned Portis and if they have the front court of Portis and Ibaka on the floor together, I don't think anyone's really looking to, <laughs> to mess with those two on the floor. So uh, that is a nice combination. Uh, one last one on, on Ibaka. It's been a little bit interesting. If you just look at over the course of his career, you know, a guy that early days in OKC shot the mid range jumper pretty well, stretched out to the three point line. And it's, it was kind of, even just based on, on per 36, if you look at his, his attempts from three, they sort of peaked around 2016, 2017, around uh, that range. And it's kind of been trending downwards, which is kind of funny. And I know it hasn't been a huge amount of minutes, but I am a little bit surprised that how often he's kind of posting up and trying to score on hook shots and around the basket rather than um, being a guy that is uh, shooting a jump shot that historically, even again in that year, the where he attempted the most three-point attempts 
per game. It was around four per game. He shot 39%. You know, he shot it really, really well. So I'm a little bit curious the more we see of Ibaka, whether he becomes uh, a guy that uh, is out there on the three-point line uh, a little bit more. Because he's certainly an upgrade as a shooter in comparison to someone like, you know, Robin Lopez, who played that backup role uh, a couple of years ago. I'll mention now NBA but, but season. Does he, but does he have a celebration of a Robin Lopez? I I don't I can't picture what Serge does when he makes threes. I don't know that he has a good celebration. So well, he's you know, a chef. drinking drinking the tea, like that 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 is, that remains to me an elite uh an elite three point celebration. So Serge, yeah, we know Serge is is uh likes to cook, so he's got a maybe he's some sort of chef chef celebration. He's gotta gotta get going. Yeah, I mean Robin Lopez drank a few cups of three, and then uh, basically just said, I don't know if I need to play in M- NBA anymore. I don't even know where he is. Where is he? Cleveland. Uh, they did need an extra big, so that makes uh, total sense to me. All right, let's uh, talk about the season, ultimate pro basketball season preview. Uh, after you're done with Locked On Bucks, we thank you for listening to Locked On Bucks first. Make sure it's first, but after that, you can check out the ultimate pro basketball preview, a six-episode extravaganza to get you ready for the NBA season. Local team experts and NBA insiders of the Locked On Podcast Network and Odyssey all combine into one ultimate NBA preview. Search for the ultimate pro NBA preview 2022 on your Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, not uh, not the Abu, Abu, not the Abu Dhabi trip that we were after, Frank. A win would be nice here at some point, but we've got a couple more post-game podcasts to do in the preseason. Any thoughts, any words of wisdom to leave us with? Well, uh, I mean, we, we can't so, – somehow I became the Lindell Wigginton, like, fan club leader, right? Like, I don't know how this happened, but at some point last year I became the Lindell Wigginton fan club guy. Give him uh, the two-way and let's just get, let's, let's just, let's yeah, get let's on just, with it. Let's, let's quit this charade. Uh, AJ Green, congrats, he hit three out of six threes, but uh, Wigginton was better. And it's kind of funny because I actually find Wig- Wigginton <laughs> – he's a little annoying in the sense that he's a score-first guard – so, you know, if you're, if you're out there in garbage time, hoping that, you know, Marjan Bochamp is going to get some kickouts for wide open threes or something like that, like Wigginton is not, is not the guy who's going to help on that front. Um, but, you know, he's athletic. He knows how to get to his shot and um, inconsistent three point shooter historically, but um, hit a couple on Saturday and it, it was okay. I think it was 34, 35% last year. So, I mean, you know, kind of passable. Um, I feel like he's, he always looks off balance. He's always like kicking his legs around and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, he's, I think he certainly has made a, a good claim on the two way spot. I mean, I would, I'd be happy if the Bucks had some other guy that, you know, I'm, and I'm not going to do research to scour who all the potential two way options are out there. Sorry. If you guys have any ideas, ping them at us. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there's maybe other guys out there that, that could be interesting as well, but, uh, AJ Green, Man, how rough is it? Hopefully, like, AJ Green's family doesn't love to listen to this podcast, you know, just catching random strays from from us Bucks podcasters about AJ Green not deserving a contract. But that's – that's we're just being honest, you know. Let's let's be real here. So, um, I don't know. what What is your – what's your gut? What is, what is the likelihood you think that AJ Green makes it to the start of the regular season as a two-way Milwaukee Buck? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd be surprised just because of the other options that are right there in terms of they just overall skill set bring a bit more to the table. But having said that, maybe AJ Green on the Wisconsin herd does do a little bit more. I'm I'm not sure. I mean, it's hard. I mean, we only see what we see with him playing with the Bucks. But yeah, I mean, it's just a it's a surprising it was a surprising signing just because of the one the seemingly one dimensional nature of. Uh, what he does. By the way, we should uh, have a shout out to uh, old friend Justin Robinson while we're talking about two-way players. He actually uh, he tore his meniscus and looks like he's going to miss the oh. entire season uh, back in Australia. Only lasted one game, so uh, that's a shame. It's a shame for an old friend. Well, really, ending this uh, ending this app on a on a low note, King. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll see. Um, I, I will say, I will say, AJ Green has a. 17% chance of, of <laughs> making it to the regular season <laughs> based on no information whatsoever. I have I have not even bothered trying to ask around to see 
if there's any future for AJ Green uh, with the Milwaukee Bucks. It just seems so obvious that he should not be the two-way guy. Shades of Bronson Koenig, just like, wait, what? Wait, okay, that was a mistake. Let's move on from this. Um, but who knows, right? There, there, there had to be somebody in the scouting department who like is like the AJ Green table pounder. And um, hopefully it's not John Horst. Uh, and, and hopefully, you know, whoever it is, comes to their senses and admits, you know, all right, I owe everybody a beer. I was wrong. That that just doesn't make any sense to carry, to give, you know, a few hundred grand to, to this guy to uh, be a, a two-way guy for us. So anyway, I think we're deep into uh, preseason podcasting at this point. So only only a few more days of this left came. By by the end of the week, we will be, by, by, by Thursday morning, we'll be done with preseason games and all that stuff, which I am looking forward to. Um, so yeah, onward and upward. Now I'm looking forward to getting into the real takes in a week's time <laughs> and getting really emotional about what we're seeing on the basketball court, but, uh, we will be back tomorrow. So we'll continue the preseason stuff. Like I said, in a couple of days, a weird back to back, uh, to wrap up the preseason. But, uh, the good news is a couple of post game podcasts and, uh, maybe the Bucks will get a win. We'll see. We'll be back tomorrow.